Hello, everyone, and welcome to Feminist Question Time, brought to you by Women's Human Rights Campaign, the leading global organization defending women's sex-based rights against the threats posed by gender identity ideology. There's more information on the website, womensdeclaration.com, where you will find our declaration on women's sex-based rights, which has been signed by over 19,300 people from 138 countries, and it is supported by 364 organizations. As well as signatories, we have activists. WHSC has country contacts in 48 countries engaged in defending women's rights. If you would like to get involved in, in WHRC, please fill in the form we have on our website. This week, we have with us Anna Salakova from the Czech Republic. She's a radical feminist, feminist fr uh, from Czech and Vietnamese descent. We also have Victoria Argoti. She's from Colombia. She's historian, translator, and yoga teacher. And she's an activist with Iniciativa Pro Equidad pro-equity initiative. It is a gender and prostitution abolitionist radical feminist movement. We also have with us Joana Petra from Romania. She's a feminist scientist, activist, and author of 7,000 Years of Patriarchy Until the Radical Era. Then we will listen from Zapataria podcast, a podcast by lesbians for lesbians from Brazil. And we will end up with Suzanne Force Beerling from the USA. She's a psychologist, a writer, educator, and choreographer. I'm Anna, and today I'll talk about, I'll update you a bit on the situation of gender identity uh, in, uh, in the Czech Republic uh, through this. And I just saw that there's been this new document that has been released uh, by the Czech government. So it's called the Czech Governmental Strategy for Equality and the Removal of Barriers Infringing the Dignity of LGBTI plus individuals uh, for the years 2021 to 2026. Uh, so before that, I'd like to uh, talk about what about the existing laws for now uh, concerning gender identity. So today, uh, in order to achieve legal gender recognition, one has to be at least 18, undergo sterilization, divorce if they're married, uh, receive a gender identity disorder uh, diagnosis, and undergo sex reassignment surgery. Uh, last, uh, I also, last time I was here, I talked about this, and I also mentioned that there were a few legal attempts to make legal gender change easier, but they were all overturned. Uh, although the laws remain the same, there has been a new development, which is this document. And it's a document first of its kind, uh, which has been written and uh, published by two government agents, uh, which are the Government Commissioner for Human Rights and the Committee for Sexual Minorities of the Government Council for Human Rights. Um, it's This document sets the direction and boundaries of the government's activities related to the rights of LGBTI plus people. And it's mainly, the document is mainly based on national EU and international documents. Uh, this strategy gives different tasks to, for the relevant governmental organs to complete in order to reach the goals set by documents by 2026. So I will now move on to the main part of the document, which is, uh, you know, the objectives that uh, they want to do, uh, they want to achieve. Uh, but I will only talk about uh, the ones related to gender identity issues and the ones that I judge more, most important, but there's also, um, of course, there's also some positive plans uh, for the LGB community, which is, you know, for instance, uh, uh, legalizing marriage for all, but I will not talk about those, I'll only talk about the ones related to gender identity issues. Um, so the first, firstly, they uh, aim to include in the criminal code crimes motivated by sexual orientation and gender identity or other reasons. Uh, the document does not specify what a hate, hate crime motivated by someone's gender identity entails. Uh, so I'm not sure whether misgendering someone uh, yeah, <laughs> would be considered a hate crime. Uh, second, uh, they aim to make state organs take into account the situation of LGBTI plus people in facil facilities for people deprived of their liberty or dependent on care. And this is an important and alarming point as the document specifies that this entails measures such as the placement of people in relevant facilities on the basis of their own gender identity. So therefore this means that men could, uh, could claim to be women and be sent to one's prisons, for instance. Uh, fourth, uh, I mean, third, uh, the strategy also stipulates the inclusion of trans and intersex issues into the education curriculums of health professionals and psychologists. 
Um, fifth, in schools, they intend to distribute and propagate documents which detail what homophobia slash or what and transphobia looks like and how to prevent it. Of course, I mean, I was not provided in the document with the definition that they would give uh, uh, to these uh, schools about what transphobia is. But I, I mean, I assume that it will be uh, through a trans ideology lens, which, you know, again, is concerning. Um, Six, they aim to add LGBTI plus issues in school curriculums and hence in text school textbooks as well. Again, a very concerning point to me, the most important part of the document. So they aim to ensure the right of self ID of trans people. And they also mention intersex people, which I kind of find weird because why are they grouping these two very different groups of people together? Um, but yeah. Uh, so in order to complete this goal of self-ID for trans people, uh, they call for the following changes. They want to abolish the requirement of sterilization and sex reassignment surgery in order to achieve legal gender recognition. Uh, the strategy also points out that if the person freely wishes to undergo sex reassignment surgery, it should be covered by health insurance. They also want to abolish the requirement of a gender identity, identity disorder diagnosis and the requirement of divorce if married. Um, they also want to enable minors to achieve like, legal gender recognition. Uh, and the document also mentions that it will limit the role of parents or legal guardians in this decision. Uh, I also want to restrict the publication of gender information in public identifiers, re records and documents. Uh, and uh, they want to increase the protection of trans people against the publication of their original identity, i.e. their biological sex, in public records. You know, this is a strategy document. So I'm wondering like how important is this document and how successful it can be. So I think it's important to say that uh, since April, the strategy has been in the interministerial com comment procedure. So it hasn't been fully approved yet. Uh, um, and when I looked at the debates between like Czech politicians, uh, mainly center and right wing politicians have expressed their oppos opposition to document, while the increasingly popular uh, progressive party called Pirates uh, voiced its support. Um, I mean, even plans of legalizing same sex marriage remain a point of heated debates. So I presume that when it comes to gender self ID, it would be even more difficult for such laws to pass today. But of course, I'm not sure. I'm just um, hypothesizing. Um, nonetheless, this document is important because it is a document first of its kind, uh, which legitimizes the trans activist position in the Czech Republic. And it's for the first time done by like government organs. Uh, and I assume that due to globalization and the expanding of social media's power, young people are also much more familiar and, and comfortable with trans ideology and think that it's like progressive. I mean, that's what I see on the internet, at least, uh, that young people are more and more um, kind of brainwashed by, by these ideas. Um, hence, while I do not think that the measures concerning gender identity will be successful right now, I worry that they will be in the near future. We move on now to Colombia with Victoria, and Victoria is going to give us an update on gender identity ideology and women's rights in her country, and also what uh, she's been working on with uh, her organization. Well, first, I want to talk about um, the fact that uh, a transgender person, uh, a trans feminine, man was appointed as the secretary of women and gender issues in in a city of a very important city not the capital city of colombia uh, this person didn't last long in the um, in in office and uh, quit her or his job this is a man obviously and this person used public uh, funds to uh, encourage prostitution because uh, he, it had uh, this project that gave uh, laptops to, to prostitutes, to women and trans prostitutes, uh, just to have them, uh, they have them able to, to work online, you know? This, this is one of indicator of the situation of, transgender activism and trans rights. And, and 
um, women's rights. No? We, are, we are being replaced and the persons replacing us are encouraging prostitution and, and are not protecting our rights to, to be free of exploitation. And this um, repercutes in the situation of all women. In Colombia, the prostitution, the trafficking, and uh, the strip of human rights of women are, are in a very bad situation. We have we are uh, we have a border with Venezuela. We have um, a, a very problematic region at the north, where waves and sprees of Venezuelan women are coming with no resources, looking for jobs, looking for opportunities. And all they received is uh, was trafficking. So in Cúcuta, uh, this is a city that's, that is in the border with Venezuela, the trafficking situation is really, really, really bad. We have a lot, thousands of women being exploited and uh, the government is doing nothing to save them, to address the trafficking. Instead of that, they appoint people who endorse and encourage so-called sex work. So we have we have a pip state in in Colombia, and one of the results of this is this case. Um, several months ago, it was reported that a child, a very little child, a girl called Sara Sofia, was missing, was disappeared. And uh, when, the, when the case went public, the situation was very bad. You know, they said that the mother had killed her and threw the body into a river in Bogota. When we see more into the case, this mother, which is 19 years old, and the so-called stepdad is 45 years old. And this 45-year-old man is actually the pimp of this 19-year-old woman who has a two-year-old girl. So this is an exploited woman which is being punished like the worst mother ever as the as the child killer and people can cannot see that she is a victim of sex trafficking and the media insist on tell this man that is his a sentimental partner his couple her couple that that is the the girl's stepdad and this only serves to excuse the man and blame the mother even more. So we have Carolina Galvan, which is 19 years old, a victim of sex trafficking, completely overwhelmed by the situation. And this man, which is a pimp, which is, which is a true criminal because she has said, every, everyone involved there, has said that he exploited her, that he forced her to go into the streets and prostitute herself and bring him all the money. So this cannot be a sentimental relationship. This is a trafficker and she is a victim, but she is being judged as just a child killer. So this is one of, of the results of, of the agenda of uh, sex work and transgenderism while in the public in the media um, uh, men autohenophilic men fetishize themselves and um, and gain you know start them in the media women that are being exploited are being punished while being victims so uh, I think the situation is really, really, really bad. Um, also, I would like I would like to to show you uh, this association of transgender activisms 
that are also, of course, uh, sex work encouragers are working in the in the neighborhood who is the most um, um, I don't know the most uh, prostitution place. This is uh, the place where prostitution has its center in Bogota. And, and these people uh, fetishize themselves, uh, uh, do the drag thing all the time, and they took advantage of the strikes. I don't know if you um, if you were aware of the strike and the violent riots and the uh, police brutality. We live in, in Colombia in, in March, uh, in uh, April. May and June. I don't know if you have heard of about that, but they went and do this drag dance and performance and striptease and everything, and they gained the, the, like this this uh, stardom in the, in the media, and they have a lot of uh, of public support. Even the the that sign a peace agreement that have their own kind of feminism they are uh, falling in this trap of transgenderism so they have they have even a parallel march um, that go against or uh, apart from from women's day and they have like this lot of days to uh, commemorate uh, and celebrate their identity. Like every month, they have these uh, marches. They they convoke these marches to have people support them. So they are like overlapping, like trying to take the place of the feminist fight, and people are falling. So uh, what we see here, because they they say they fight for for trans people. But what we see here is our male, males fetishizing them femininity on themselves, wearing femininity as a costume, and, and thinking that this is a political action. So they go on a strip and, and sexy dance in front of violent police, but they don't fight with the police actually. And they just show themselves. They just uh, take advantage of the protests to show themselves. So this is a very bad situation. I'm, I'm, I'm really, really worried because these kind of, of, um, of characters uh, are more successful day by day. So we're being replaced by <laughs> transgender men <laughs> in Colombia. So that's, that's exactly, that's just what I wanted to tell you. These are just men trying to replace us and endorsing and promoting prostitution with, I don't know what support from ONGs or uh, world capital, but they are, they don't lack money. But uh, people who have shelters for uh, survivors, for women that are escaping violence and prostitution are, are just, well, fighting to get, to sustain their, their fights. The Constitutional Court recognized uh, work rights to so-called webcam models because uh, a webcam uh, woman, ex exploited woman, uh, was fired from a webcam studio when she was eight months pregnant and she uh, sued the owner of this studio and the Constitutional Court, the case got to the Constitutional Court and uh, the Constitutional Court even used the language of uh, sexual services that even if, uh, if the woman and the owner of the studio didn't have a contract signed, he had obligations, uh, work obligations with her. So this is very bad because the, even the constitutional court is, is uh, endorsing prostitution and endorsing pimps.
And now we're moving on. We're coming back to Europe because we're going to talk to Joana Petra and she's from Romania. She's uh, going to start uh, by giving us an overview on, of the situation regarding gender identity ideology in Romania. First of all, uh, I have to speak about the uh, situation of the trans, trans culture in Romania. Uh, Romania is literally geographically placed in the middle of Europe. And everything bad that appears somewhere else, everywhere in Europe or in the West, gets here very quickly. This is not uh, available for Nazism and communism, but also for the trans cult. Uh, the trans cult is already present here, also not very developed, not yet. There are a lot of uh, trans people in Romania. Actually, I know a few. And uh, they, but they are still uh, not very common. The, the cult is not very successful so far. Um, I actually, um, there, uh, there are not something new for uh, this place. They were described in some old novels, even in the, during the 19th century. There are novels, there are, uh, a, a little stories about them, but uh, they were very marginal at that time. Um, the, the, but uh, what I see is the uh, problem with this uh, trans, uh, trans cult um, in, in the feminist uh, environment, in the feminist media. Uh, actually, uh, in Romania, like whatever in Europe and in the West, most feminists are liberal and uh, they are very proud of that. Um, I remember one of them when I um, told her about the radical feminist group, group I created, told me that she didn't want to join a group if it was transphobic. She got angry when I told her why radical feminists um, um, felt threatened by the tra trans cult. It is amazing such so-called feminists are immune against any radical critics of the cult. Um, if we want to find an opposition against that, that, that cult, we find it in the right-wing uh, parties and in the, uh, at the right-wing uh, politicians. We have, such, we have such things, we have plenty of such politicians, <laughs> um, actually, um, um, especially after the pandemic. They are like champion, like uh, wheat everywhere. Um, um, a few times ago, it was a political proposal for a law um, of banning any discussion about gender in schools, university, and everywhere in the public space. Um, this stupid, strange law didn't pass, but the conclusion is the. Um, is um, that the, uh, um, right, uh, only the right wing and traditional politicians who don't care about human uh, and uh, about women and feminists um, have a voice uh, against the, this uh, cult. Uh, they only care about tradition and religion. This is their reason about uh, uh, again um, behind this opposition. The politicians who oppose the trans ideology uh, also, uh, also oppose gay marriage, sex education in school, um, and any rights for the, so, uh, for the sexual mi minorities. As I know, I am the only author who wrote about the trans cult in a feminist manner. I published uh, a few articles in a tiny cultural, cultural magazine called Egophobia, except my book except my um, blogs. And uh, what I can say that is nobody talks about uh, what is happening in sport after that uh, cult uh, conquered even this, uh, even this uh, field. Uh, in 2002, uh, the gold uh, uh, Romanian gymnast uh, lost her medal because he was uh, ill, he was uh, treated with neurofen, an anti-inflammatory drug, and it was uh, considered 
a doping. But now uh, there are a lot of uh, men who compete uh, as uh, women and nobody cares about it. Um, I know I don't, I just wonder what uh, Dirk Burton would have said about the situation. <laughs> Uh, but there is a, a good uh, a good side of this story of, of this uh, situation in Romania. We can still criticize in, in, in university in the public spaces um, the uh, trans cult, and all almost any uh, we, we can expose any almost any incorrect political idea. It was like that um, before the war when here in. Um, Romania, the freedom of speech was spared for a longer time. Um, it was uh, be before the uh, the war. Uh, it was one of the last such places in Europe, but we paid for for uh, that with forty years of communism. Only I think uh, there is no uh, uh, can, uh, so far there is no uh, such a. A uh, huge um, danger um, related to the tra trans cult in Romania. Uh, one reason is the opposition against uh, Marxism and um, the, uh, this uh, cult is uh, related, is associated with uh, neo, -ma neo Marxism, with uh, progressism, uh, progressism uh, which people hate because because of communism, because of their communist heritage and past. So far, it's a little better for us. What about your work as a feminist scientist? Uh, can you tell us more about your fight against neurosexism and sociobiology? That is uh, the idea of misogyny being enshrined in, in science. I can tell you a lot about this. But first of all, I have to, to uh, I can to tell you about a lot about the trans tra, trans cult, which is a uh, um, scientific nonsense. In the condition when every human and animal and even plant cell have um, has um, um, sex chromosomes, uh, this uh, there is no possible no such there is no, uh, such trans is no uh, there is no possible. It's, it's impossible because we have the sex in any uh, cell. We have a lot of uh, genes in our um, in, in uh, on our chromosomes, in our sex chromosomes. Uh, actually, it's not possible to to to, to change uh, uh, a man in, into a woman and um, the opposite. It's impossible. Uh, it's a, um, a crime ag against the biology. Then, uh, related to neurosexism and uh, sociobiology, biology, I can say that the, um, the gender roles are preserved uh, using um, pseudoscience. Uh, the age, um, the age of uh, Broca and uh, racism. Uh, didn't uh, end. We have now. We now we have a lot of uh, uh, sexism in science. We have a lot of um, um, of problem related to um, to the, um, sexist ideas. Um, neurosexism uh, speaks about the uh, male and female uh, sex. Uh, in the way very similar to what Broca said uh, during the 19th century. Uh, then there is um, sociobiology or what they call um, um, evolutionary psychology, which uh, does uh, the same. Um, ac according to such ideas, very popular among um, young uh, people, especially male, and the male atheists, um, women are a kind of inborn prostitutes and only we have in mind only one thing to find a dominant male in order to raise their children and spread their genes. 
they would accept uh, abuse and polygyny uh, for that uh, higher purpose. Um, uh, as we see, um, this is a kind of uh, social uh, social Darwinian, Darwinism applied to uh, animal behavior, which is very uh, contested by a lot of data. There are voice in um, biology, like Franz de Waal, who is very famous, who oppose these ideas. And um, um, they, uh, such scientists uh, started to write about um, another models in, uh, uh, during the, in the human uh, evolution, um, opposed to the men of the hunter and the women, the woman as a housekeeper. No, in, in fact, uh, in, even in chimps, uh, females hunt, females uh, make more inventions, they are more creative, they get their ants, they make tools. Um, and uh, such uh, scientists like Dawkins take patriarchy, patriarchy as granted. No, uh, during the, uh, our history and uh, during uh, our evolution, uh, females and uh, women like now did almost everything. Um, and uh, I, I, I wrote uh, about this in my book uh, and in other articles, I tried to debunk these uh, ideas. Okay. Uh, so, um, but uh, now there are other voices who start to tell something similar with data. Yes. So now that you've got your slides on, could we go back to uh, so you could have a couple of minutes to tell us about about your book, Seven Thousand yes. Years of Patriarchy, yes, please. So. This is the paperback and the ebook format. Uh, and uh, my book uh, also, I write, I wrote it, uh, having in mind uh, young uh, girls and women, and I, which I wanted to make them know a lot, uh, about, a lot about uh, their situation in patriarchy. Uh, couldn't help uh, expose some scientific uh, ideas. They are here. There are. Um, new science, original scientific ideas, we, uh, which I want to publish in, ad, in academic journals about uh, animal behavior, about uh, genetic aspects, uh, um, history of the human uh, kind, but seen from another angle, from a feminist per perspective. Uh, so, um, but uh, the uh, most uh, important challenge in this book was to make it uh, very accessible, very friendly, um, and um, able to get a larger audience um, as much as possible. Um, I have, I, uh, have some daring and original analysis uh, analysis about uh, uh, the origin of patriarchy, uh, male dominance in animals, in other animals, other primates, uh, about patriarchy. There is no, uh, which is not uh, present in nature. There is male dominance, but not patriarchy. Yeah. Uh, about uh, some anal analysis about sex and gender, inter intercultural analysis, literary critics. There are a lot in my book, but uh, I think uh, very um, accessible, at least uh, partly. We're going to Brazil with uh, Sabataria podcast. Please excuse my Portuguese pronunciation. Uh, we're going to have one of the activists that, that uh, she chose to, to remain anonymous. And uh, she will tell us about the Sabataria podcast, when and why it was started, who is it for, 
and what are uh, its achievements? So my name is Lisiane, and me and my friends Camila and Giovanna started the Zapateria podcast on January 2020 with other two women who are no longer part of it. On 2018, Jair Bolsonaro was elected president in Brazil. Since then, a conservative wave has been installed in our country. And with his hate speech, other people felt free to talk and take hate actions. Looking for lesbian content, we discovered most LGBT Brazilian productions talk about gay or trans people with no focus on lesbian sexual orientation. The few content there was wasn't politicized. We have also noticed the homosexual movement affirm to affirm the gender identity like an option, not an oppression system. In this context, we felt the need to create a space to talk about our lesbian experience and disseminate lesbo feminist theories. That's how the Sapataria podcast was born. This show is for all women to listen to. We hope to politicize them so they understand how they can break with patriarchy and live fully as lesbians. In the beginning of our project, we didn't say we were gender abolitionists in hopes to achieve a bigger audience interested, interested in our things. But in 2021, we began to speak more openly about our political position on gender identity. And at first, as expected, we lost some followers, but not too long after, our numbers grew. That shows us, even though there's a growing queer speech, there's also a growing need of content that actually embrace us lesbians. We have published more than 60 episodes and 200 Instagram posts, all focused, focused in, on lesbianism. We have now almost 10,000 followers on Spotify and a little more than that on Instagram. We have made episodes about political lesbianism, lesbian separatism, compulsory heterosexuality, marriage, compulsory maternity, and how the gender identity invalidates lesbians, making us believe we have to change, take testosterone, and adequate ourselves to fit in a heterosexual pattern. So this month, month we have a special programming for Purple August, which is considered lesbian pride and visibility, visibility month due to an act by GALF, Lesbian Feminist Action Group, in August 19, 1983. By the time we were living under a military dictatorial regime, this lesbian group has been prohibited from distributing their journal with lesbian political content. It is a big mark to Brazilian lesbian history, our own little stonewall. So this month, we are talking about the importance of nominating ourselves lesbians, emphasizing that doesn't make us excluding of other people. And finally, I found the declaration on women's sex-based rights on Instagram. In reading it, I noticed it aligns with everything we believe in. It's uh, very nice to find something as big as that going on internationally. And I'm very honored to be here with you today, sharing a bit of our work. We are going now to the U.S. to talk uh, to Suzanne Forst-Wirling. She's, uh, as I said, she's a psychologist, a writer, an educator and choreographer. And she's going to tell us 
about how gender identity has appropriated the concept of intersectionality. I'm going to talk about intersectionality, Black womanhood, and really what I consider a form of white supremacy on the left here in the United States with what we are experiencing with colonization and the erasure of womanhood. Um, so I have spent my time, uh, a lot of my time in higher education, in psychology, on, uh, so, so inside of psychology, business, in, I was a chair of a business program, um, marriage, family therapy, counseling, all of that. And I, I've had many students graduate. My, my programs, part of my responsibility were my programs. I had students out in the real world doing internships in prisons, community centers, uh, mental health facilities, locked units, locked uh, hospital units and things like that. Um, so when it comes to intersectionality over on the law side of academia, I'm just going to give a quick um, definition of or understanding of intersectionality from the point of Kimberly Crenshaw, the, the woman who coined it, coined the phrase and, and, and wrote summaries about what it means to be Black and woman. Um, so, she, you know, she, she stated that, you know, being a Black woman, those two intersects, those two demographic variables are inextricably tied. There's no separating it. You, you, you come as a Black woman. It's very difficult to separate uh, both of those things out. Um, both identities come together when dealing with cases of discrimination, which is what she is commenting on on the law on the legal side originally. There was a case with General Motors where black women were not hired to work in the office with white women because they were black and not hired in manufacturing with black men because they were women. So there's an old uh, saying that, that a lot of us uh, will say to each other in, in academia and amongst black sovereign women and things like that. All the women are white, all the blacks are men. That's been like a theme that black women have had to deal with since post slavery. For example, black men and white women got the right to vote before Black women, First Nation women, Latina, Asian, things like that here in the United States. So this is the, this is the premise of what she's talking about. But my whole experience has been in psychology, not with law. And we never had, uh, well, I'll get to that. Um, so what is intersectionality? This is a broad understanding. It is a deep awareness of how each person belongs to multiple communities simultaneously. It is to understand that some aspects of who you are is visible to the world and some are not. So if you are a brown skinned, physically disabled, Native American woman, all of that is visible to the world. Um, and then there are some aspects of who you are that's not visible to the world, and it could be hidden if you wanted it to be hidden. So if you are a lesbian and there's nothing sending a signal or sending a low piece of information, you could keep that to yourself. It is a part of you. It is who you are. No one's saying to deny who you are, but that is, that is invisible until you make it visible. Um, Intersectionality, along with um, marginality and centrality, allows you to understand your level of oppression or privilege in your community, in your world, in your space. It is to understand how your life is positioned and affected by multiple intersecting identities. Each space that all of us are in 
as a proximal relationship to power and oppression, and it's all on a continuum. So for example, maybe a, um, maybe a biracial black woman has a, is positioned in a little different spot than say a brown skin black woman or a dark skinned black woman, for example. Now, power and privilege is another concept, you know, that, that, that we all talked about. We live in this European dominant culture, European slash European American values, laws, systems, infrastructure, and military, right? For now, that, that, that is who the dominant group and the dominant culture is right now. Um, all European people, all white people, regardless of sex, gender expression, sexual orientation are visible as members of the dominant group. All other people are decentered from the dominant group to varying degrees. So, um, okay. So Crenshaw coined the term intersectionality, even though we did not even know about her. So I am dating myself. I'm talking about 1995, starting in 1995, dealing with these issues and having to use, having to go to the library and print articles, you know, literally uh, off of the shelf, no Google, no nothing. So we all had to go to primary source and we all had to draw from a variety of uh, um, disciplines to teach without any awareness of what was going on on the legal side. Bell Hooks, and Crenshaw's work dovetails very nicely with each other. Bell Hooks talks about the centrality, marginality continuum. How far away from the center are you? And the, the center is white, male, heteronormative, middle class. That's at the center. And we all vary around that center. And the, the more visible we are away from that, the more marginal we are on a continuum. It's very important to understand that, especially with dealing with, with uh, everything that we're dealing with, with men in uh, our spaces and taking away our rights. When you are from a less powerful, visible group, you cannot opt in to a privileged group. And when you are from a privileged power group, you can opt in to a subjugated group and you don't need permission of the subjugated group to maneuver in their community, as we all know very well. Um, and an individual can have a, can have a, a foot in a power position and a foot in a subjugated position, for example, white women and black and brown men. There's a little foot in being white and got a little foot in there of being a man. And I know the women are on the call going, we don't have any power, what are you talking about? <laughs> but, you yeah, know. Okay, over on the psychology side, black women academicians did not have Crenshaw's work we were focused on behavioral health and helping our students and helping the clinical world to be better providers of treatment to black and brown women, to women in general, to poor women. Some of the things that happen to poor women of all nationalities is just horrendous. And since, you know, many of us, we create, you know, we, we, we were creative in communicating to our students. So we use terms like three strikes to talk about race, sex, and, and class. Black, female, poor, brown, female, poor, white, female, poor. Or double trouble being black and female. We say double trouble. And so on to describe to our students. Okay. Here is a, uh, boy, this is like two semesters in, 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 one, in one little slide, but you know, I talked a little bit already about double trouble and three strikes. That is like the crux of, of intersectionality. 
And then we also have something called double bind. This is where black women hesitate to call law enforcement, i.e. white patriarchy, white supremacy on black men. So double bind is a sacrificial position that black women put themselves in, sacrifice the safety for black men who are perceived to be completely crushed and oppressed by white supremacy. That's a double bind, that, that sacrificing, risking yourself inside your community in order to protect the men. Double patriarchy. We understand that we have a ruling patriarchy. We understand that we have you know, a system in place that's set up, but all women of color are also a part of their own cultures, men, their own cultures, patriarchy. And so a lot of, so women of color straddle, straddle two layers of patriarchy and have to try and navigate and negotiate inside of both at the same time. Also, women, Black women are straddled between an androcentric Black culture, meaning male-centered, males are prioritized, and a woman's movement where we don't necessarily always move together and in sync with each other. So we, we, we've got that double uh, straddle there. Intersectionality is really just a concept used to understand, clarify, and honor someone in their full self with no erasure, no minimizing of what someone can be experiencing based on a visible or invisible identity. Now, how did this happen in mental health? Believe me, uh, no one just dragged these concepts out of the clear blue sky and they are required uh, coursework to complete in order to get you know, your degree and in order to get licensed. The profession was moving swiftly and therapists had to become culturally competent immediately. This is in the 70s and 80s and it progressed very quickly in the 90s when um, then Governor Ronald Reagan shut down mental institutions and people were just put out on the street. And so grant funding, federal funding, a whole bunch of money came down and therapists had to adjust this new business model. Community clinics were opening up all over the place and therapists had to make that shift from doing analysis. You know, we go to therapy like three, four times a week. You know, you got money, you pay cash to a more medical model uh, insurance reimbursement, state and federal reimbursement. And um, white therapists were, uh, uh, you know, people from communities, people of different cultures would come in once and never come back. And white therapists were like, oh my God, what, what's happening? It, you know, so literally it was a business imperative for everyone to become culturally competent. Clients, patients, consumers were just not trusting white therapists. And, ev and everybody had to examine that. And people had to do their self-exploration and do all of that work. And we had to find ways to teach students, teach the next batch of therapists how to be you know, culturally competent so that you know, they can have a trusting, good trusting relationship so that they can help in the healing process. Okay, I'm gonna talk about a case study. So I love action for my students. You know, I always tell them, get your work done, get your hours in, do the best clinical work that you can, you know, when, when you're out there. But it also, if you see something, do something. So, um, so this is a, a, a low case study where therapists were at a clinic and one young white woman got a black woman into therapy and she had about third stage breast cancer. And she was receiving treatment, oral, some type of oral medication. And uh, so the therapist was like, 
that's interesting. And then another black woman came to her caseload and another and another. So she stopped and said, let me look at the systems and let me, you know, I got dragged through these classes learning about intersectionality and learning about um, systemic racism and, and uh, classism. And here I am at a community clinic, poor women. They have third stage breast cancer and right around the corner is a hospital that looks like this. And people are getting MRIs and scans like this. And they're getting chemotherapy, radiation and surgery. But I work at a health clinic, multidisciplinary health clinic where there's health, mental health and other things. And women are getting oral medication. So instead of, you know, oh, I'm gonna stay in the office and, and do my clinical work and this is my job, this is my role. She stepped out of her role to make some phone calls, bring in the leadership of this health center, pull, you know, build some bridges with folk at this hospital because she said, women at this hospital are really real getting treatment and, and black women here are getting almost palliative care. This is not right. So a few phone calls, she handed it off, continued to do her work and the women here were routed here. So that's an action step. And that is what I'm accustomed to when it comes to taking theories and concepts and putting them into action. Otherwise, we're just talking, you know? So my, um, so many of my students did, did things like this, you know? I told them, look, don't burn buildings down and don't sacrifice your career. But, you know, you can, you know, do some things, get, get some things um, going if you see a systemic issue. This, this situation could not just be blamed on, or not blamed, but assigned to an individual not working hard enough or, or something like that. It was a real, um, a real systemic issue and a big gap that literally could cost people their lives. All right. Now, unfortunately to me, I hear people using the term intersectionality in such a, in such a odd way. Over time, with all the knowledge that we have in terms of cultural competence, we have the same poor outcomes when people interact with various systems. You know, what should have been a continued increased awareness of how better to serve people in a more humane way as an aid in understanding how systems and individuals interact in order to improve design effective programs and so forth. Let, let's eradicate systemic unintentional abuses. We all hear about the intentional, but what about unintentional? A lot of things go, uh, uh, go through. We, it, it, if we had kept on the trajectory in mental health, in law, in um, uh, social work, in social justice, in law enforcement, we could be in a better place. Um, now the term is just thrown out like a badge. My feminism is intersectional. What is that? You are not intersectional if you don't include men in your feminism. Okay. And here's one that comes specifically from the Black community towards Black women who speak up about sex-based issues. Hopefully some of my friends will laugh at chuckle at this one a little bit. Black women got that intersectionality from white feminists, those dangerous white feminists that destroyed the Black community. That's like a common, common argument inside the Black community. <laughs> and we always have to say, you know, we have brains, you know, we have, <laughs> you know, we've been fighting for a long time. It's not like, um, we're just sitting there and, uh, and we don't 
uh, have any uh, agency, okay? I don't know if anybody's heard that. Let's get right to it. You know, here is Rachel Dolezal and here's Caitlyn Jenner. I categorize them as European Americans. That is what's visible first and foremost, symbol of power, both of them. But the narrative out there is she's trying to be, she's transracial and Caitlin is transgender and somehow Rachel, the transracial is the bad person and Caitlin is the good person or whoever is the, whoever is that person. Um, and a reminder, when you are a visible member of the dominant culture, you have the power to jump in and out of subjugated spaces as you wish. So it's performative, most definitely. Okay. Caitlyn Jenner was in a golf tournament and then now is running for governor saying that men should not be, male bodied people should not be in women's sports. Well, you know, could kind of do what you want to do, right? That's power and privilege. That is the ability to be able to do all of those things. But both of these. Uh, people, more so Caitlin, have erased the fact that they are of European heritage and diminish it and try not to talk about it as much as possible and just use the labels transracial, transgender. Rachel Dolezal also sued Howard University for ra racial discrimination. So she was able to jump out, rock out a lawsuit, and then jump back into being uh, a light skin almost white passing black woman, okay? And men will never give up their power. I don't care who they are. I don't care if they're from a weak patriarchy, a not so smart patriarchy, a ruling patriarchy. I don't care what color they are. Men will never give up their power. They will never abdicate. And I think that that's what we feel. We know, you know, uh, that, that that won't happen. So it doesn't, you put on dress, I don't care. Men will never give up their power. They can articulate that that's what they're doing, but they will never do it. It's their life source. So my experiment was that I said, I identify as a white male and I expect everyone to address me as such. And I expect my $5 million line of unsecured credit. And that's that. And I want to see a piece of paper that says that my FICO is 800. Okay, perfect. Chop, chop. Do it right now. And obviously it didn't work out for me. But just to be able to articulate a demand to opt into a space where my visibility would not allow it, you know, so... Um, you know, we've had discussions around my experiment, my students and my colleagues, you know, just for a little humor, but it feels kind of good. I grew up uh, where I live, a British man came to my neighborhood, came not my neighborhood, but came to my county in one of the wealthiest enclaves. And he just walked in, he had a British accent. He walked in, got a million dollar house, rent free, got both of his kids in school, top uh, school, $20,000 a year tuition, country club, everything, and went for like a year without paying anything. So he just literally walked in like he was an American Express card and they took his skin color and his British accent. And, you know, obviously he was a shyster, but he got away with it for like a whole good year just, just for doing that. All right. How men unintersectionalize themselves by erasing their race. I noticed that many of these men do not get called out for doing this. And I think that they should be called out. They take all the speaking points from black culture and the civil rights movement. I've heard men say things like, oh my gosh, it's like being at the lunch counter. It's like, for those of you outside the United States, you know, African-American people used to protest and civil rights movement by doing sit-ins inside of 
white deli, delis and small restaurants and little breakfast spots that only whites could go to. And, you know, then they'd be, you know, pushed around and, and, and all of that for being there. And that, that was the lunch counter. And we've all seen videos and they're not fun. So they'd say, oh my gosh, it's like being at the lunch counter. Or, um, oh my gosh, it's like Rosa Parks. Oh my gosh, it's like a lynching. And you're like, a lynching? My goodness. They talk about the murder rates of Black transgender individuals over and over and over and over. Even though there's very, there's, I haven't seen any crime reports. And I know a lot of my sisters share data. I haven't seen anything where white transgender individuals experience the kind of crime the way that they talk about. Uh, they weaponize Black trauma. So they have no problems bringing up the most horrific things in meetings, just casually. They just feel entitled to do it. Um, you know, um, And then they say Black over and over to the point that you forget that the person who's speaking is white and natal male, who is the actual demographic who harmed black people to create the trauma that the white male claims to be experiencing. Gaslighting times a hundred. They adopt the language of oppression or the language of how women speak about their, our, subjugation or about racial justice and, um, and, and civil rights. They never, ever, ever talk about being white. It's actively avoided. Um, and they have the power to punish anyone who's gotten out of line and everybody knows it. So nobody walks in a room and thinks, oh, this is a woman. Nobody does that. Everybody's like, hi, Jennifer. But everybody's like, that's a white guy. And, and, and he could do some damage to you. Men have conquered men for thousands of years and all conquerors understand the importance of eradicating language, identity, and freedom of movement. It's very clear. It's a long-standing pattern and we are in it right now. Once colonized, man has access to all the populations at his whim and he does what he wants. So I was asked, hey, what are, some, maybe, what are some ways to respond to gaslighting, emotional abuse, the, the narcissism? Well, really, one of the solutions really is break up with that person, get rid of that person, get away from that person. But we can't do that. Um, you know, oh, I, okay, thank you. I think, I'm, I think this might be the very end, um, you know, Remind, I think that they need to be reminded that they are privileged men, natal white men. I know people are tired of the word privilege, but it really does have meaning in this, uh, in this that they're not subjugated. You're, you're not subjugated. Um, you, you actually don't have a high murder rate. You, you actually are not um, oppressed. And the only demographic that can subjugate you in any way is another natal white man. That's pretty much the only person that has any power over you, is someone that looks like you. Remind them that they are gaslighting when they align themselves with African-American social justice, racial justice issues. They are the demographic that created a lot of the things that we're dealing with. It's unfortunate, but I think that that helps to push back. Um, remind them that they are gaslighting when they align themselves with women's issues when they created the unsafe conditions for women around the world and have yet to really do something about femicide, equal pay, and all of that. In fact, it's just a not, all of the exploitation is just getting notched up, notched up. Um, Remind them that they are uh, chromosomal XY and that a declaration of a feeling is nothing. It means nothing. Many serial killers have verbally declared themselves to be nice guys, and we have paid the price for that. 
um, remind them that predatory behaviors exist in the mind and the intention, not the appendage. So even post-op, because they were trying to weasel in on that, even post-op, rape and the pleasure that some men experience when they know they have discomforted the woman is based on the thoughts, not the appendage. Thank you, everyone.